but my name is Victoria Silverplan. I've joined the GNC core team uh, earlier this year, and my primary focus was actually to develop the guidance that I'll be presenting today, the nutrition humanitarian needs analysis uh, guidance with this accompanying calculation tool that is for piloting. Um, it's quite important to keep this in mind. We, we tried to streamline as much as possible this process and there are certainly room, you know, there's room for improvement and adaptations, especially at country level. So we kept it quite broad. And the objective of this session is to walk you through the different sheets of the tool and kind of key considerations to keep in mind as you'll be uh, testing it out at your countries. So uh, just in terms of some housekeeping, please keep uh, your uh, video off and muted just so that we ensure a solid bandwidth for the recording. And if you have any questions, uh, please pop them into the chat below. Um, as well as your name and country and email so that we can be in touch with any further correspondence. Uh, my colleague Shabib will be monitoring the chat and if anything urgent comes up, he'll also let me know. Um, Shabib, how's my sound? Is it okay? Yes, clear and loud, uh, loud. thanks. Okay, great, wonderful. Uh, so that said, uh, unfortunately, it's a bit tricky to make Excel really big, so I hope um, everyone can still see my screen. Let me just shift my, yeah, there we go. I'll try to make it a bit bigger. I don't know if anyone else's eyes are like mine these days, but um, yeah. Okay, so I'll, uh, I'll shift through the, the pages and the sheets, and I'll try to readjust the, the Zoom um, so that everyone can read from their screen, but don't hesitate to read it off the version that's readily available online. There are some small tweaks in the version online with this one. So we're gonna send everyone in, this email, um, in the chat with your email. So that's why it's quite important for us to have your email. It's gonna be up online next week, but we did discuss with Shabib and some other colleagues some small tweaks so this is why uh, make sure moving forward from next week onwards, I'll be sending an individual email as well, but that you'll have this version for piloting. There was just a couple of things we want to really stress that they're right now included for testing purposes and not based on solid evidence. Great, so let's jump in to the different sheets. So here we have 12 sheets in the tool. And what I'm going to do is just walk through broadly each of the sheets and some key considerations. And I've also color coded them to different to follow the guidance, the different steps of the guidance that's included for for the word document on the nutrition humanitarian needs analysis. So I invite you at the same time that you're using this tool to follow the guidance note as well as there would be further explanations included there. So in these two first sheets, indicator registry and classification thresholds, um, the indicator registry is very common to all of you. It's a, the same sheet with some slight adaptations from the uh, nutrition cluster caseload calculator that's currently readily available. So what I did was took that as a base for this tool and added as you can see, many more sheets. So the indicator registry, I won't be spending too much time as it's just been adapted from the existing indicators registry and framework. And we then have the classification threshold. So I'll jump over here to the classification thresholds. And this is a list that is the first attempt to streamline which indicators is deemed core for your nutrition situation analysis. So it's quite new. This is not a list that would override any kind of, the, the indicator registry is as comprehensive as it's always been, but this list is really to help support the subsequent sheets when it comes to nutrition situation analyses. As you can see here, we have different categories. So primary outcome, 
A number, most of this guidance is also aligned with IPC acute malnutrition and its framework. So it's adapted from the UNICEF um, conceptual framework on malnutrition. And where does that fall? What are those different categories? If colleagues have had experience with IPC acute malnutrition, you'll fit right in. And the indicators that we deem core. An important point in this guidance moving forward is that we're gonna be discussing three scenarios. First scenario, if you're in a country where there will be an IPC acute malnutrition, I just believe I understood Yemen will be doing uh, an, acute uh, an IPC acute malnutrition in a couple of weeks time, then you look at, you're in the context of scenario one. So then you only look at scenario one, and most often, if you're doing an IPC acute malnutrition analysis, most of these yellow tabs, so those corresponding to a nutrition situation analysis, do not apply, okay? If you're in a scenario two, where the under five global acute malnutrition levels are above 5%, then you're in scenario two. So if an IPC cannot be done in your country and you have high levels of GAM for children under five, then you focus on scenario two and only two for the nutrition situation analysis. Then if you're in a context where global acute malnutrition under five is less than five, then you are only looking at scenario three. So we're trying to streamline the thought process between these three scenarios so I'll repeat once again, scenario one is if an IPC acute malnutrition analysis will be done and that will feed into your nutrition situation analysis. Alternatively, if an IPC acute malnutrition cannot be done, then it is scenario two when we have uh, global acute malnutrition levels uh, for under fives at a, above or equal 5%. And finally, scenario three, that the levels of global acute malnutrition is not kind of a a primary concern and it's less than 5%. This is important because certain indicators may fall into different humanitarian consequences. So as you're quite familiar with the HNOs and the humanitarian needs overview, there's different pillars that are taken into account um, when doing the analysis. For nutrition, we primarily focus on physical and mental well-being, quite evident as it has a direct impact on the physical and mental well-being of the population. But we also have living standards. So for here, one example is stunting. If we're in a scenario one or two, this would fall into living standards in kind of our analysis. However, if we're in scenario three, we would put this in physical and mental well-being. So some slight differences. Predominantly, it's, it's mainly just stunting and overweight that has these differences, so it's not the whole list. But then we do have, per indicator, suggested thresholds that were, oops, sorry, it's kind of hard to maneuver, um, that we have a severity scale and where are the, what are the thresholds and the sources. So you could see here, we're basing ourselves on IPC acute malnutrition version three. It's very similar to the WHO UNICEF guidance that was released in 2018. The main difference is that we have a phase five where they only have a phase four phases. So we thought it would be important to have a catastrophic, hopefully no cases are like this, um, or at least commonly. And we thought it was important to maintain the five point scale and have that differentiation for GAM based on weight for height. And then we have different ones for MUAC. So MUAC is a bit more tricky. So ideally we'll, we'll be seeing this later on, but when we, here I'll just kind of shimmy over here so you could see. For MUAC, these are preliminary thresholds as suggested by the IPC acute malnutrition team. And you can see that they overlap two phases, each of them. So this is where it's not as straightforward the use of MUAC only. And as per the IPC acute malnutrition, there's a series of steps to consider when using MUAC as a primary um, indicator for severity classification. So I'll get into that shortly. And then we have um, some 
thresholds here. So this is for GAM based on pregnant and lactating women, which are preliminary in nature. Preliminary is that right now at global level, there's no threshold. So we're putting forward some thresholds to test out. Once again, it's for piloting. So we'll see how this works. And then we have a series of contextual factors. So these ones here are optional to consider. So once again, you know, when we're looking at our annual uh, assessment plan with our indicator registry, it's important to keep in mind which indicators listed here as core indicators could support your nutrition situation analysis. Here we have a number of contextual factors, so optional. Once again, they're not kind of streamlined or mandatory, but will be seen in the subsequent sheets that perhaps if you're in scenario three, it may be good to consider more of these than less. So I'll get to that in a moment. And then we move into immediate causes. So these are our IYCF. So we have five IYCF ones, where we also note that for the minimal acceptable diet in children six to 23 months, not only would you need the minimum dietary diversity, but you would also need minimum meal frequency as well to derive the minimal acceptable diet. So something to keep in mind, and that's why we flagged it here. Exclusive breastfeeding and uh, key indicators by the infant and young child feeding in emergencies core group, so the IFE core group, that relates to the distribution of breast milk substitutes. Then we move into WASH. So we have WASH indicators here um, as being a, a key underlying cause when it comes to acute malnutrition. And then we go into the other analysis of key uh, contributing factors, immunization, ones were being put forward, health status, availability of access to health services, and immediate causes, food consumption. For food security, please note that where the priority one would be a food security cluster or sector analysis or IPC acute, um, uh, acute food security analysis, and we would take in this phase. All these uh, additional kind of from the other sector, so nutrition sensitive indicators, um, are all optional, right? We're, we're trying to give a list of key considerations when it comes to nutrition, not uh, your annual nutrition assessment plan. So if you're going to be using representative surveys like SMART or MIX or DHS or other representative surveys that you're undertaking at country level, then these are key indicators that we think would be useful for your consideration. Once again, you do not need to include all of these in your nutrition situation analysis. It is more to help streamline and guide each and one of you into a similar path. So this summarizes the classification threshold. So the, you, I invite you to look at these more and more. Um, just in terms of the severity scale, in case you have not yet used a severity scale and quite new to all of this, if we have a GAM based on weight for height at 12%, then we would characterize it as a serious or severe situation in phase three. So here we're looking at the point prevalence and not um, the confidence intervals. Another important point to just flag before we switch is this is where advocating for more children zero to 59 months. I know this may not be the case given um, pre-existing data where often it is six to 59 months, but that does not mean you cannot still use these thresholds. So as we put here, if you do not have data for this age group, you can still use six to 59 and these thresholds. Um, Shabib, are there any kind of key questions on this coming in now to address, or should I continue? You can continue. No question until now. Thanks. Okay, wonderful. Uh, then, similarly to those who have uh, taken part in IPC, um, we're looking at tracking as much as possible the repository. So, hopefully, at country level, each of you have a beautiful repository of all data. And here we want to keep track of which data was used and the reliability of the evidence, um, the associated reliability 
so that we can keep track of what was used in terms of information. So name of report, source of report, data collection period, date of publication, but also based on the IPC acute malnutrition reliability score. So in the guidance, it provides a breakdown of what would be the most reliable. So generally looking at cluster representative population-based surveys, so SMART, MIX, DHS, and so forth. Um, where less reliable would be maybe the methodology would um, be a screening. So screening would be considered limited methodology, but it could be time relevant or not time relevant. So very outdated, but the methodology is a representative um, population-based survey. So anyway, I won't get into more details here. You could see the, the figure on the, the word guidance on what each of these re refer to. And it's important that we just keep track, a small x for each of the evidences used so that when another colleague joins in and wants to support the nutrition situation analysis, it's very clear what was used and what wasn't used. Similarly, we have a team composition. So this is adapted, once again, from the IPC acute malnutrition. Who was involved at country level from the nutrition side were members of the nutrition uh, technical working group, yes or no. Of course, you could add rows as you see fit. From the different sectors as well, were they included, did they take part? And once again, a nutrition situation analysis is not just, you know, myself doing it by, alone. This is very much a collaborative process. So um, having more people, the better, because this is where a real consensus can be achieved. So once we have our classification thresholds in mind, evidence repository, we're keeping track and we know who's going to be part of our analysis team. Now we're going to move into specific scenarios and what do those look like? So here we have, once again, scenario two is GAM, um, under five GAM above or equal to 5%. And what we did here was trying to streamline once again the thought process. Ideally, we would want GAM prevalence based on weight for height for children zero to 59 months. As you can see here, I have a 12%, so my same example that I used previously, and it would automatically take this classification based on weight for height. If this one was now 25%, then it would change to phase four based on my GAM weight on based on weight for height. If this is null, if we don't have anything, then we would look at GAM, uh, if GAM weight for height is not available, then we do based on MUA. So once again, remember our thresholds uh, go across two phases. So here we automatically prompt that in scenarios where you do not have GAM based on weight for height, then you look at GAM based on more, yet you need to provide justification for the value because although this would automatically go to phase four, it actually may be rather phase three. So I'll just show you once again, those thresholds here. Remember, so here at 15, oh, sorry, it could be critical or extremely critical. If I have, I'll just come back here now, uh, 13%, it goes with the higher value here, uh, the lower value, so it assumes the lower phase automatically. And the 13, once again, could also be critical. So this is why we're prompting automatically to justify if MUAC is being used, what would be the phase? So we're not necessarily just assuming the same phase that's used here, but we need to use justification for the value and a line is provided for each row. In cases now that GAM based on work is also not available, so we don't have GAM based on weight for height and we don't have GAM based on MUAC, then we would do GAM prevalence based on PLW. Most likely, most of the countries, this would probably not be the most readily available information, but once again, we're trying to streamline the process as much as possible. So if this was not available, 
then automatically it would take the GAM for uh, prevalence based on, we on PLW. So we would do this for each of the administrative levels. It's important to note that since we're doing automatic classification here, you cannot add uh, columns. So we'll get to, you know, to keep track. These are kind of the lowest administrative levels that you have data on. Um, these evidently will be changed and uh, we'll be seeing in kind of a different couple other sheets where we can add columns and not columns. So um, if ever I forget anything, Shabib, please let me know. <laughs> we also uh, locked just without a password most of these sheets just in case there was any tweaking being done and then it would adapt kind of the automatic classification. Um, in terms of so we would do our severity classification. So we have our key indicators listed here that would be used for the severity analysis. And then we would also have a, an accompanying qualitative analysis of those key contributing factors. So remember that long list, whether it's uh, those contextual factors that are optional or uh, indicators from the other sectors, here we're going to do a qualitative analysis. So you could see here, we're just looking at whether it's a contributing factor, no, minor, major, or critical. Okay, and so we have right now a four points based on the five phases that would automatically apply for each of these indicators. Once again, this is only for scenario two that these indicators would be included. So if I had to compare scenario two sheet of analysis of contributing factors with scenario three, there would be differences. So I tried to flag what are those differences so that everyone is on the same page. So if we go here, once again, a similar automatic classification would be used. Whereas for the other sectors, it's important that a number of these would have to manually insert a phase number because um, they use wording text. So I couldn't include the wording text. So you would have to manually see between the classification thresholds, what is that outcome and manually include it so that we have the same colors here. So all of this is just included now, but will be adapted based on which indicators. And similarly, for a number of indicators, especially in health, there are no proposed thresholds. So you would have to use consensus. So within that analysis team and expert judgment to determine what would be the phase. So unfortunately, there's not always those thresholds that we can align ourselves with and colleagues would have to discuss and say whether which phase it would fall into. And then accordingly, we would have um, that analysis of whether it is not a major contributing factor, a minor contributing factor, or a major contributing factor, or a critical one. So those four points. So this sums up for scenario two. So if I'm in a situation where an IPC acute malnutrition analysis cannot be done at country level, but my levels of global acute malnutrition uh, for children under five is above or equal to 5%, I only look at these two sheets. If I'm in now perhaps a Latin American context, then we have a bit more complex nutrition situation analysis. So what uh, was devised, so through this task force that was helping, supporting me in the development of this guidance, we look at kind of 10 key indicators. So here, um, we have them here, it's, and we did a preliminary scoring system. The preliminary scoring system is based on a three-tiered approach. So these first ones in purple, we deemed most relevant for this context and allocated 60% of all these points that we derived per phase across these five indicators. We then said second tier of importance would be then prevalence of anemia in pregnant women and the two uh, IYCF indicators relating to um, breast milk substitutes. 
So that would allocate 30%. And last but not least, GAN prevalence is for other population groups, so older people and adolescents, and 10%. Evidently, because certain indicators like stunting, anemia, and uh, GAM for older people only have a four point scale, we went with the lower end of points for these. So we didn't make up points because they fell in a different one because we didn't have that threshold for the five point scale. So this scoring system is of course preliminary, it's to be tested. And what we're trying to achieve is a full picture of what would be happening in these contexts where there is a low GAM for children under five and what out of these, how many points would be associated. So if I have a prevalence of um, exclusive breastfeeding for children zero to five months at uh, the equivalence for phase three, then I'm allocated 1.68 points and that will be over here in the full table. If I have a stunting prevalence uh, that's higher, then I'd be allocated 3.6. So what this point scoring system will be doing is at country level, colleagues for each of these would be filling in the prevalences. So you can see here it automatically changes color. And for each of the three categories, so the purple, the blue, and the green. And then at the end, we have a score that's calculated automatically. And we have our phase classification based on, once again, preliminary cutoffs. So if we have a score that falls in between, that's less or equal to four, it would be phase one, phase two between five and 13, and so forth. So once again, we've locked without a password these sheets just to make sure that there's no kind of tweaks that may happen in the mix. But we have, of course, our contact information between myself and Shabib if you would like to make any changes, but also to give us feedback. If you want to be using different indicators with a similar uh, scoring system, I, I remember I had some conversations with the DRC colleagues that please let me know, right? This is only a way to improve the tool and make it better. So if we have an understanding of what would be better indicators in the contexts where we have GAM based on weight for height less than 5%, then we can take this into account for the subsequent iterations. So hopefully um, that's clear. And then similarly to what we've seen in scenario three, we have a severity classification. Um, per geographical area. So we can see that it's, it's automatically done. If you want to add rows, Shabib added this fancy function that you could also add here, change the number to more than 33. And then at the bottom here, you could have more than 33 rows in case you have many administrative levels and you need to add more rows um, as we go along. Shabib, is there anything else to mention here? Uh, no, you cover all. Thanks. Wow, okay. <laughs> some, some question, but I will uh, really uh, raise this question after. Okay, great. Okay, thanks. Uh, so once again, scenario three, we're looking at the sheet, and scenario three, very similar as we've already seen for scenario two, is the analysis of contributing factors in this kind of qualitative analysis that would accompany your uh, severity classification. So in that output of your nutrition situation analysis, you would have your severity classification, but also the analysis of key contributing factors as well. Uh, just so both uh, of these yes, are I'm very sorry. complementary. Yes, uh, go ahead. Should be if someone um, want to move uh, the, the column to the right and add the code, in this sheet, it will be difficult because it is linked with uh, the code behind so we cannot shift yes. The, yes so you can use the b code after that you link it uh with in other sheets thank you yep and you could easily you know add a new sheet with the codes and everything associated if you rather put in the codes versus names that can be done as well but however given the complexity of the sheet and the calculations 
um, we only have this one column. So whatever is best, is it admin names or code numbers that can be used? So I, I think it's up to your discretion. Shabib, is that all set? Yes, thank you. Awesome. Um, and then, so this is concluding now our nutrition situation analysis. And we're now moving into our infamous PIN calculation, so the number of people in need. So we once again tried to facilitate things as much as possible. So a number of these um, points would be included uh, just like in the caseload calculator. So there's not too many differences, although a number of things are also uh, done automatically, but it's more extensive. So the purpose here of our PIN calculations is really to provide a more holistic nutritional need analysis and number of people in nutritional need versus those who are more focused on the wasting only. So this is why we have not only population figures that can be inserted, but we also have now three sheets, sorry, I'll just shift over, three sheets of different nutritional means and where they would fall into. So I'll go into each of these um, to calculate, evidently, the number of people in nutritional need will need a series of population figures. So once again, here, I do believe you could add columns here, that won't be posing an issue, right, Shabib? Yes, it's if okay. Wanted. Yeah, here, here is no problem to add columns. And we would have our population figures and the percentages of each of the key target groups. So here we have children zero to 59 months. We also have disaggregated data if available. And we're working all here with percentages. So we provided some starting percentages here for zero to five months, six to 11 months. But of course, if you have data at country level, these all will be changed and adapted to your country. We also have the breakdown from pregnant and lactating women. So here we have PLW included as a whole, and here we just have pregnant women, older people disaggregated by men and women, and same thing with adolescent girls and boys over here. So depending on the information you have at country, you can complete this as much as possible. Ideally is at least for the entire age group, but we generally are pushing more and more for sex disaggregated data. So hopefully we could have a breakdown or at least assume a 50% breakdown if you have no information. Um, so I think that could be a key point. Oh, we have a raised hand. Is it time for a question? Okay. Not quite. Maybe in just about five minutes. Is that okay? Uh, that's fine. Because I don't see this. Can we add more column? Like how many children are disabled children? Yes. Yes. You could add columns here. Okay. But then you would just have to make sure that you bring, you could change this if you have number of uh, boys, girls, if you have disability, you could add columns accordingly you would just have to carry over the formulas. Thank you. Great question. Um, and then we have other information here. So the in incident correction factor. So here we put in red because we know that a number of countries are using different incident factors. So we didn't want to just put 2.6. So here, this is what each country would have to adapt according to what is being used at country level. And then the expected kind of programming percentages, expected proportion of SAM cases for inpatient, for outpatient. We're looking at MAM cases for programming and also cases for blanket feeding supplementation program. We also have similar kind of more programming expected proportion ones for PLW that would also need to be adapted. So all of these kind of blue estimations to insert is for your adaptation to, to include and change. And then this will automatically generate all our key nutritional needs per kind of category. So for here, um, we'll have a series of 
uh, nutritional needs automatically calculated. So here is the first time we bring in CGAM. So I imagine a number of colleagues are already familiar with it, but it's an aggregate indicator that takes into account both the GAM levels based on weight for height and those based on MOAC and bilateral cadena edema. So it's kind of showing the overlap of those, of, uh, those two criteria. And it's a more holistic um, account of global acute malnutrition in children under five. So ideally, if you have that information and with the latest smart software updates from earlier this year, you can have CGAM automatically calculated in the, in the report tables from SMART. That said, since we haven't been using CGAM in the previous sheets, we would need to use the prevalence, we would need to now insert the prevalence of CGAM here and the prevalence of CSAM. So CSAM is the combined severe acute malnutrition indicator that would help us then indicate the CSAM number of children in need. Here we also have the breakdown of SAM. So in order to differentiate our nutritional needs from SAM and MAM, we also now need to include SAM. As you can see, all the previous steps are only focusing on GAM. So this might be a quite the shift from what countries were using previously, where a number of them, if I recall correctly, were also basing severity classification on SAM. We're no longer recommending that and basing it on GAM as we have global level thresholds and not for SAM. So here is the first instance where we would insert our SAM prevalence, whether it's based on weight for height, MUAC, and even for uh, PLWs, pregnant and lactating women. So in essence, once you fill in population figures and these estimations, these will be automatically done based on the available evidence. So if evidence is included in scenario two, it will take it from the scenario two sheets. If evidence is taken from scenario three, it will be taken from the scenario three sheet. And you, based on um, what you have available. Here we have CGAM. I would only then be taking the CGAM numbers uh, versus those weight for height and more because CGAM would be preferable. We also have the number of children, so disaggregated by sex, and the other nutritional needs that we have in relation to undernutrition and overnutrition. So we also have SAM, GAM, MAM, and also contextual factors where we also have, um, oh, so contextual factors based on scenario three and contextual factors based on scenario two. So those differences and here, um, the overweight, sorry, would be included in living standards because it doesn't come into physical and mental well-being. My apologies. So all of these should be done automatically and we show where the information is being taken from. Okay. Um, we have this similarly for the living standard. So remember in that classification table, we also have the automatic classification for uh, the various indicators listed here. So this is based on data from scenario two. And if we have data from scenario three, we would have it included on this side of the sheet. And we have now PIN for all micronutrient deficiencies. So a number of these have not been included previously. So we have quite a bit more information, estimations to insert here before the automatic calculation is done on this side. So we have, you know, at the end of this process, you're gonna have multiple nutritional needs, right? Based on the programming and the key indicators that you have and the severity classification from the previous step, we did not automatically aggregate it into one single pin. And the reason for this is that at country level, this is gonna be very varied on what would be now the key nutritional needs that would constitute your pin. So this would be the step that you as IMOs would have to be leading to aggregate into one kind of sectoral pin 
at the end of the day that would feed into the HNO. So we did not provide kind of automatic analysis guidance on how to do that because this would differ per country and having an automatic system would just be very confusing. Um, that said, you know, as generally people are doing in the previous years, you would aggregate by target group, right? So we'd look at children under five, we'd look at pregnant and lactating women, and we would aggregate and generally take the higher one. And so in terms of double counting, we're looking at the highest one of all the nutritional needs that we would have. Um, I saw a number of hands raised, so I know that there's questions, which is quite common. And I think, should be anything else to add before we jump into questions? No, thank you. Thank you, Victoria. Okay, great. Um, perfect. So I guess I don't, uh, Shabib, do you want to start off? Are there any questions before we go yes. to Yes, the... you can start with uh, Aya and Kutub because they have the question in the chat box. Also, they raise the hand so they can ask also the question. Okay, go ahead, colleagues. Yes, Aya? Yes. Sorry. Yes. So sorry. Uh, my question in the chat box earlier was uh, one there, I think Victoria mentioned it, but I didn't quite catch it. One there, one, the country IPC analysis will not include IPC acute malnutrition analysis. What do we do? Because we're trying to, uh, we're trying to negotiate with food cluster. Uh, and, and, and the food cluster was going to conduct another round of IPC analysis and we checked if they were going to include IPC acute malnutrition analysis and which would not be included. Then how can we, yeah. I think you mentioned so, something about it, yeah. Yes, yeah, so if IPC acute malnutrition, so that specific, right, as we're focusing on the nutrition piece, cannot be done at country level, then you look at scenario two in terms of sheets. It pertains that our scenario two, so in the guidance, we have a decision kind of tree that you could see on the first page that outlines if you're in a context of IPC acute malnutrition analysis, great. The IPC global support unit will be leading the analysis. If it ever is not be done for acute malnutrition, then you can align with scenario two. Uh, copy, thank you. Yes, uh, Kutub. Thank you, thank you very much, uh, Victoria. It was uh, such a nice presentation. And I can see the hard work you people have done it. Um, <laughs> Uh, my question is uh, regarding South Sudan. Uh, for our last uh, HNO, we use for severity mapping, we use three indicators. One was GAM, and then SAM, and then vitamin A supplementation, vitamin A coverage. So for us, was three indicators there. And uh, uh, then for uh, HNO, we use a CGAM. Uh, but now, uh, this year, uh, because of COVID 19, uh, things become very different. Uh, uh, last time we had a very good data. We had smart surveys. We had FSNMS. Uh, this time, and FSNMS, uh, uh, we don't have any anthropometric, and uh, they will uh, go, likely go for the family mock. And uh, there's another discussion about the reliability of the family mock, but uh, the result will come late. Sure, because they are starting now, so maybe in a you know time we will not have that uh, uh, family mock. Uh, the now the screening data, which, which uh, what we receive so far is a uh, is uh, uh, I, I must say like uh, is a uh, is passive screening. It's not active screening. Those are, these are those kids who are coming to uh, uh, health facilities. They are screening only those kids. So it's not an active screening there. So uh, again, uh, we can't uh, uh, rely on that one. Now for us, we have only two options, uh, and uh, unfortunately, when we when we talk about so severity mapping GAM and SAM, maybe we will be not able to go on that way because currently we have one, we have very good program data in South Sudan. Uh, we have uh, like uh, from 2014, we have like uh, in all the country, we have a very good programs and we can see the admission spark in down so we can 
easily do okay what's going wrong what is where is the malnutrition increasing and where is decreasing but the question is now uh, i think because of this covid 19 and uh, i must say that we need to go we need to think out of the box we had uh, fsnms uh, data from uh, like around is 25th 26th round now so for 26 rounds we have fsnms data then we have um, smart surveys last years like uh, we, we had and so i think this will be uh, good if we can go to something like uh, statistical regressions or uh, modeling or classification so uh, i we really need your advice on that regard as well uh, thank you very much over to you victoria Thank you, Kutab, for your, for your comments and uh, sharing the South Sudan context. I imagine a number of colleagues are in a similar boat. Um, I think, you know, already South Sudan, you have a lot of data, even though it may be from last year. And we're actually just in the process of releasing a second brief. So I don't know if many of you are aware, but we're also part of the Global Technical Assistance Mechanism in Nutrition producing briefs when it comes to nutrition information systems in particular. And so we released one about mid-April and we're just in the process of finalizing a second one. That provides some food for thought when it comes to these nutrition situation analysis using existing data. So I think majority of the countries right now, you will need to be, as you're saying, Kutab, thinking a bit more outside the box on how to adapt and interpret existing data based on the context. Um, and it won't be just one source, right? We're going to be looking at the trends that you've already mentioned, or admission trends decreasing because people are scared of going to health clinics. So do we assume a deterioration or not? What are, you know, we're trying to put a bit more now the different pieces together and how can we extrapolate for this year to the best that we can based on evidence that's already existing. So, um, Generally, we're not recommending to do more kind of statistical, elaborate um, modeling techniques. Um, what we're looking at is more the confidence interval of previous information. So I'll stay tuned. The brief number two should be out, as I said, in the coming days. So as soon as that's out, I'm sure um, you'll all be aware of it on the website. So keep an eye, but I could also send uh, a quick email blast to all of you attending today with the brief in hand as well. Uh, great. Uh, we also have a question before we answer Said uh, and Kashif. And Mary, she asked how to proceed in case of the availability of gamma prevalence for both weight for height and MOAC. Yep. So. Generally, uh, is, is it the question for nutrition situation analysis? Uh, and Mary, because you don't mention, it will be for so, scenario two, I think, yes. Yeah, for scenario two. So we deem that weight for height, um, the thresholds here, as the global thresholds are stronger than the preliminary ones for IPC, we deem this one would override, if both are available, the GAM based on MUAC. So as you can see here for Baglan, we have 35%, which relates to a phase five. The phase five is taken versus the phase three or four, that's for the GAM based on MUAC. So for the severity classification, we deem that weight for height, it will override the severity analysis then based on what if that is not available as i showed previously then gam based on what would be used and simply it's also until we have global level thresholds for MUAC that are more robust this may change of course right but right now that is not currently the case and therefore that's why we took that decision Good. i hope that answered the question okay thanks mm -hmm. So uh, uh, Said, uh, Said from uh, Afghanistan, please uh, okay. go ahead. Thank you, thank you, Sharif. Uh, thank you, Victoria and Sharif, for your uh, good work. I have some comments actually, but I am thinking about how it's practical to use it based on different contexts. Uh, the first comment is about the the pen. 
honestly is uh, not only based on uh, what we are uh, one thing is missing from this uh, calculation the OCHA always provide the pe people on move returnee refugee idps internal idps mm -hmm. so that's a uh, different and we receive that information from OCHA. so it's uh, somehow is not depends to the specific geographical area and with the, the people on move and uh, honestly we exactly doesn't know the prevalence on those people just we may need to do kind of rapid assessment to know at least what's the situation situation so that's something uh, we need to take it in account uh, the second issue is about uh, one uh, based on this platform we are doing kind of situation analysis on nutrition situation but on the other hand uh, while we are going to prioritize you doing a HNO, we need to also consider the service delivery platform and the, um, uh, what, uh, what I can say, the capacity or accessibility uh, of the services. So for example, maybe there is a high, uh, a very deteriorated uh, situation in one area, in two areas, the same situation, but uh, we need to also consider or uh, contextualize what's feasible and do we accessible. It's very uh, uh, practical or uh, important for Afghanistan, for example, based on the, this conflict, insecurity, in some area we don't have uh, access. So that's another issue. The third uh, uh, is a, uh, just a kind of a question or clarification. Uh, based on this one, you did the last uh, very detailed analysis on having, for example, with micronutrients. Uh, as a cluster and emergency, we are focusing on the life-saving intervention and it is not our role to focus on those, for example, iron, iodine deficiency, these things. So what's the use of that part? Do we need to do calculate all of these things? If we are doing all, for example, for us, uh, the sum caseload is the biggest issue we need to prioritize. If mixing this different indicator to make an index uh, diverts us from prioritizing the most severe area, more sum cases, for example, what would be the consequences? Thank you. And the last one is about the data availability. Data, data availability. Honestly, this is the, the most challenging part. Uh, for example, I, I think uh, this year we have two, three smart survey, not more because of quit, and we won't have it. How we can apply this template? How we can use this template? So thank I'll, you so I'll much. work. Uh, thank you, Said, for for your numerous questions. Um, I'll work backwards, uh, just on the, the the points raised. So data availability, as I've already mentioned to the other colleague, uh, this will be a massive challenge for every country. And, you know, where we are suggesting, as I said in the second brief, that will be soon released, steps to consider when using existing data. And we definitely recommend using existing data and extrapolating from it versus picking, you know, data from thin air, right? We, no one, we can't invent data. So how can we use existing data and make the most use of it and cross tabulate with what we're seeing in terms of trends, in terms of programming and so forth that uh, would be super important. And even in terms of accessibility, as you mentioned in the context of Afghanistan, which is quite critical, um, how, how would you adjust and use that? So looking more at the confidence intervals. Uh, when it comes to micronutrient deficiencies, perhaps in your context, that would not be the priority, but in other contexts that they would need to do a nutrition uh, situation analysis or PIN calculation, uh, actually micronutrient deficiencies is a major issue. So once again, we're not saying for all PIN calculations, you have to do everything and complete it. It is more which PINs are relevant to you and you focus on those. Correct. So what are those nutritional needs that are key for the programming and services taking into account accessibility or not? You know, where do you think the response plan for nutrition, given your context, would be targeting? 
right? Um, you mentioned an interesting point with the people on the move, accessibility, and here we're looking at full PIN, right? We're not breaking it down. There's also PIN based on accessible PIN. So once you have your PIN, you could derive out of that percentage what are accessible, perhaps through the information provided by OCHA or so other sources of information. And similarly to people on the move, maybe you have for the general population your PIN, but then you would need to separate, you know, IDPs or uh, nomadic population with host population, and maybe you'd have different categories of populations, right, to look at. So the, these tools, as I said, are a starting point, but of course they're going to be contextualized and then adapted to your context. So for, you know, the columns where we have affected areas, you could also adjust it to have IDB population, host population, you know, people on the move population, whatever, what are those key population things and continue the process. Um, so I think it's, it's more a uh, starting point, this sheet, than, uh, you know, prescriptive on this is how you need to do it. And that's what we were trying to avoid at all costs, that we did not want it to be overly prescriptive versus guiding. And then countries would need to adapt and take into those um, points into consideration. Um, conscious of time, unfortunately, we are running out, so we'll have to end it here. Um, I did provide my email, and Shabib, I don't know if you also provided your email, but um, once again, please keep, uh, we have now the list of people attending, so let's keep in touch. Uh, I'll please keep an eye out for the second brief. We'll be sharing it through our newsletters and even the, the full kind of package here I'll be sending you because as, as I said, it's just a slightly revised version with some of the cells being protected just to avoid um, mishaps at country level. And I, I look forward to hearing back from you on ways we can further improve this tool based on your experiences at country level. So many thanks again, and uh, we'll certainly be in touch. Thank you, Tina. Thank you very much. Thank you, everyone. That's Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Shabib. Shabib was an excellent co-host. Thanks, Azimi. Thanks. He's thanks, Victoria. Nice. Thank you. Thank you, Shabib. <laughs> thank you. Thank you, Victoria. Victoria, thank you, thank you very much. You're most welcome. Thank you, colleagues. Thank you. Thank you. Shabib, how can I download this chat? Do you know how to do that? Uh, you will find it in uh, your uh, cloud. Okay. Yes. Okay, perfect. Thanks. All right. I will stop the recording. <laughs> and I'll, I guess I could just sign off, right? Yes, you can.